Tchaikovsky taught us more about Napoleonic history in the few minutes of his 1812 overture than Ridley Scott did in two and a half hours. This iconic piece of music does more than paint Napoleon as a villainous leader. It actually depicts the stages of Napoleon's march to Moscow. The Russian peasants pray for peace. The French invasion with the drums of war and the French national anthem La Marseillaise. Then cannon shots, the Battle of Borodino. La Marseillaise seems to be winning. Next, the French army scurries away from Moscow as winter arrives. The Russians' prayers have been answered. The bells of victory ring. Finally, the famous grand finale. More cannon shots and the melody of God Save the Tsar. Tchaikovsky and Scott, one from Russia, one from Britain, do share one thing in common. They both portray Napoleon in a negative light. That's a recurring theme. Whether you think of the diminutive emperor as a villain or as a hero depends largely on whether you're French or not. And as we'll see later in the video, the truth is probably somewhere in between. Another Russian, Leo Tolstoy, also celebrated Napoleon's shortcomings. Maybe the greatest novel of all time, War and Peace, portrays Napoleon as an egomaniacal villain. In the novel, he's called that Antichrist, a slave of history, and is motivated mainly by his image of himself as right and powerful, which, quote, to his mind, were the same. That portrayal seems to be what Ridley Scott's movie was going for. Note, spoilers will follow. Scott, born in the north of England, casts Joaquin Phoenix as Napoleon and has him say things like, I'm not built like other men. Scott also shows Napoleon taking the crown from the Pope and crowning himself. The film suggests this is an impulsive and egotistical act. Interestingly, when Beethoven learned about that move, he withdrew his musical tribute to Napoleon from years earlier by erasing Bonaparte's name from the title page with such force that he tore a hole in it. And later, like Tchaikovsky, Beethoven did the 19th century version of Throwing Shade by naming a piece of classical music after the English admiral who defeated Napoleon at Waterloo. Contrast those pieces by non-French with an early film by the Lumiere brothers, who were French. Though in black and white and only 42 seconds long, the meeting of Napoleon and the Pope shows the French emperor furiously negotiating as an equal with Pope Pius VII, suggesting that he has at least some respect for the pontiff. This was part of a careful strategy by Napoleon to win the favor of the Catholic Church, which was paramount for the French people. Indeed, Napoleon requested that the Pope attend his coronation ceremony as a way to legitimize it. And while traditionally French kings had been crowned in Reims Cathedral, Napoleon organized the event in Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris. The film doesn't tell us any of that, which would be a glaring omission if the film were trying to be historically accurate. But that's why the film feels so off. It's a movie about a historical figure, and yet its main goal is not historical accuracy. It's to make Napoleon into a villain. It intentionally doesn't show Napoleon promising to respect equality of rights, freedom of worship, and private property, as he did at his coronation. And if you value equal rights, religious freedom, and private property, and if you're a college student who wants to act on those values, Students for Liberty is for you. SFL's Local Coordinator Program, our sponsor for this video, provides training resources and access to a network that helps young people turn their values into impact. Students for Liberty alumni become leaders, innovators, and entrepreneurs, and have established a tradition of defending freedom by protesting governmental overreach anywhere it occurs. The Napoleon film, however, fails to show the Pope protesting the coronation by leaving it, which he did when Napoleon declared he would not return to the church the assets it confiscated 
during the revolution. Napoleon would have predicted the Pope's protest and would have known that he'd have to crown himself. He did not take the crown impulsively to the oohs and ahs of the crowd. That decision was carefully calculated, but the film just shows him as a bumbling tyrant. Watch the scene closely for another cinema sin. There, the painting that immortalized Napoleon's coronation in 1804 was not done in real time. As was common, the painter actually started working on it more than a year later. And that painting is more representative of how Napoleon is portrayed in France as a hero. But let's start with a deeper look at how the British historically have shown him as a villain. Because the British were supposed to be the ones in charge, Napoleon's military success raised questions about Britain's destiny as an empire. He also complicated the traditional distinctions between Britain and France, further blurring British national identity. And so the British projected their self-doubt onto Napoleon. What was he, they wanted to know? Corsican usurper or legitimate king? Italian or French? Catholic, atheist, or Muslim? They also projected their self-loathing onto Napoleon. The British Empire itself was power-hungry, hence Ridley Scott's portrayal of Napoleon as a power-hungry upstart. There's no way around it. Scott's Napoleon is brutish while making love, crude while declaring, I have just won a great battle right after viewers learn of 28,000 casualties. My dear Josephine, I'm writing to you because I've just won a great battle today. He's even brooding on the movie poster. He was everything the British saw and despised in themselves. In this way, Scott is upholding a British tradition. Cartoons in Britain, especially James Gilray's satires, have long shown Napoleon as an ogre, a monster, out of control, and mannerless. Back to that massive French painting of the coronation, or the many others which show Napoleon as charismatic and often porcelain-skinned. Clearly, in France, Napoleon is beloved. Perhaps he's that sibling the family loves to criticize until someone from outside the family joins in. Then the family gets angry and defends him. As the outlet Le Point said, Napoleon is the film of an Englishman, very anti-French. Le Figaro said, Ridley Scott profanes Napoleon. That reaction shouldn't come as a surprise. In a poll of the French public on how to remember Napoleon, only 2% said he should be condemned. To commemorate the 200th anniversary of Napoleon's death, French President Emmanuel Macron said in 2021, Napoleon is a part of us, and laid a wreath at the foot of Napoleon's tomb. Of course, going back much further in history, on literally the first page of maybe the greatest novel ever written in the French language, the character Bishop Muriel calls Napoleon great. Hugo would later refer to the emperor as illustrious. Napoleon wrote about himself too, which naturally influenced his countrymen's perception of him. His dictations while in exile eventually were published in 1823 as the Memorial of Saint Helena. Alexandre Dumas, author of The Count of Monte Cristo, even wrote a play based on that memoir. In the memoir, Napoleon considers himself an heir to and advocate of the French Revolution's principles of liberté, égalité, fraternité. As Napoleon tells it, he is a friend of freedom and was persecuted by the enemies of the revolution. Although in reality, he centralized power by taking control of the Bank of France, the labor courts, universities, and even cultural institutions like theaters and museums. Clearly, that legacy of French administrative statism remains to this day. But Napoleon's memorial became a bestseller, and it was so influential that Ridley Scott couldn't avoid Napoleon's interpretation of 13 Vendemer. That was the battle between the French revolutionary troops and royalist forces 
in the streets of Paris. In the film, as in his memoir, Napoleon suggests using cannons to put down a demonstration. One of the precious few times we see any of Napoleon's fabled military strategy. We can hope the extended director's cut on Apple TV Plus shows more of his strategic brilliance. In failing to even mention the Italian campaign where he became famous and established his first military government, the film neglects a major aspect of the Napoleonic legend. To give Scott the benefit of the doubt, he acknowledged that more books were written about Napoleon than any leader in history. He's indeed one of the most studied and researched non-religious figures of all time. Around 220,000 books and articles were published about him between 1815 and 1980, and with the advent of the internet, that number has approximately doubled. Scott therefore decided that the letters between Napoleon and his wife Josephine should drive the plot, thinking they are truer revelations of the real Napoleon. The director said in an interview that he chose to represent Napoleon as the vulnerable real man he is in his letters to Josephine. However, many moviegoers found the film uncommitted to that love story angle, while history buffs rightly observed that Napoleon's military and political skill were left unexplored. Again, to give Scott the benefit of the doubt, perhaps the sheer abundance of material is why the film felt incomplete and uncommitted. But the casting of Joaquin Phoenix is telling, an actor best known as the villainous Joker and who also played Commodus in Ridley Scott's Gladiator. Also telling is that the film begins in 1793, when Napoleon was just 24. And yet, Phoenix was 49 while on set. Scott made little to no effort to make him look younger. For most of the film, Phoenix's Napoleon is something like an anti-hero. Not well realized or humanized, he's constantly moody, brutish, even grotesque. It makes clear that the film comes from an English or outsider's perspective and seeks to make Napoleon an antagonist. So what can we accurately conclude about Napoleon as we sift through the countless politically motivated sources from inside and outside of France that show him by turns as a hero and villain? That, as always, the truth is probably somewhere in between. Napoleon advocated for principles like meritocracy, liberal property rights, and equality before the law. He also restored slavery in the French colonies, established an early form of media censorship, and has a lot of blood directly on his hands. So, pure villain as Ridley Scott would have us believe? No. Pure hero as Napoleon would claim? Also no. Human, motivated by his own interests like any other politician, and susceptible to the corruption that power can bring? Absolutely. <laughs>